Welcome to Mintel's Little Conversation. Real conversations with actionable insights into what consumers want and why. I'm your host, Andrew Davidson, based in New York. And in today's episode, we are going to turn our attention to the UK, where the nation gets set to celebrate the first coronation of a monarch in more than 70 years. The coronation of King Charles III and his wife Camilla, the Queen Consort, will take place at Westminster Abbey in London, as it has done for 900 years. It will be conducted by the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the Anglican Church, who will place a solid gold crown dating from 1661 on the King's head. Visitors to London may have taken a trip to see the crown jewels at the Tower of London, and it's that very crown that is being dusted off for this historic day. The coronation is marked by a public holiday and celebrations, but the backdrop to all of this is stubbornly high inflation, a cost of living crisis, and a country that appears to be in a state of flux after exiting from the European Union in 2020, an event now famously known as Brexit. The pageantry and tradition of the royal family is very much part of what you might call brand Britain or Britain's brand image. And by that, I mean those inextricable attributes that you associate with a country. So today we will discuss the coronation and explore what it means for brand Britain going forward. Joining me on the pod, I'm delighted to welcome Jack Duckett and Francesca Smith from London. Hello. Hi. Please introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Francesca. Um, I'm a senior consumer lifestyles analyst in London, um, and I've been at Mintel for just under two years. And my name is Jack. I am a senior quantitative consultant here at Mintel, and I have been here for uh, ten and a half years. So <laughs> very excited to be to be chatting away. Well, great to have you both. Okay, so on a scale of one to ten, where ten is super excited and one is that you you know you're not that bothered, how excited are you about the coronation? Well, I'm going to go first because I think perhaps like an eleven out of ten. I am just so excited for the coronation. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> it's hard to, it's hard to put into words why really, but I think, you know, I, the, the the news is is kind of gloomy these days. It's really nice to see something that you can sit and watch. And, and there's there's live entertainment show. I mean, Andrew mentioned in the introduction there, this has been happening for 900 years. And uh, you could give us a hard time for that. I'm sure plenty do. Or you could see a super exciting, I haven't seen one of these before. The last one was 70 years ago. I'm not, not old enough to have seen that. So this is, an exciting opportunity for me to see something new and, and, and what happens. Um, and for a lot of people, I think it, it, whether they're excited or whether they're at 11 or out of 10 or not, I think it's still something to see that's worth seeing. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to kind of put myself on the other end of that scale. Uh, I put myself at maybe a three or a four. I think oh. I'm definitely... I'm definitely interested and I'll uh, be watching and I'm excited to see, you know, how people react and what this kind of, what the event's going to look like and if it's going to have a different feel. And I guess it's going to give us a feel of what a King Charles reign will look like. Um, and definitely from a f- professional view, I'm interested, but I think personally, I wouldn't say I'm, you know, I'll have it on in the background, but I don't think I'll be dedicating my day to it in that way. That sounds a lot like a six or a seven to me, Francesca. <laughs> okay. It's nice to have a couple of different perspectives on the pod. I mean, how do you think Brits are feeling more generally about this uh, historical event? I think there's, you know, a level, there is a level of kind of apathy towards it. I mean, we've run some data recently asking people what their plans were um, around the coronation and around half of people are kind of going to continue as normal. Um and it's quite a small number, actually, that are actually participating in celebrations. So around one in 10 were saying they're going to go to a street party or go and celebrate at the pub or a restaurant. Um, and even smaller numbers are going to go and watch the procession in London. But I agree. I think that's probably painting a bit of a maybe more of a dim down picture. I think a lot of people will be watching it. I think you haven't got, you know, there's the ardent fans that will be really celebrating. Um, but I think a lot of people will, will just be will be watching along Um and as you mentioned before, it's in the backdrop of quite interesting times at the moment. People have a lot of other worries on their hands. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see kind of how it, how it goes down. Yeah, I think despite my enthusiasm, I'm not going to pretend I don't understand Chess's point, <laughs> point of view. I think lots of people are probably not reaching the 11, maybe not even the 10 or the 9 of the scale that I presented here. I think I will give my first line of defence the weather has not been fantastic in the UK, and I genuinely believe oh. it is dampening spirits in a number of ways. Yeah. We have got rain and we have got gloom. It is not the cheeriest time. Um, that it, to say that people are, are feeling gloomy just because of the weather is probably understanding what we know about Mintel. It's, it's a really tricky time. There's no doubt about that. We've come off a really hard winter, I think it's fair to say. 
you know, really, really high prices in shops, really, really high energy prices, a lot of uncertainty about how long that's going to last. Does everybody really want to sit down and watch some some chap driving around in a, a, a gilded carriage? Um, asked like that, probably not. <laughs> asked, you know, yeah. there's a bank holiday yeah. weekend, there's things to see. I think that's a slightly different different framing, perhaps. So yeah, what what is the mood in London? Are you starting to see things getting set up? Are you starting to see preparations? Yeah, I mean, there's you know, I've seen the flags up around Carnaby and Oxford Street just last night when I was walking. Um, but to be honest, beyond that, I haven't. Again, this might be you know the circle I'm travelling in, but I haven't seen you know too much about it. It feels like I know they've got plans to scale back the coronation in general because of I guess everything that's going on. They don't want to be too extravagant. But I think that kind of maybe has reflected in the the build up to it. Um which is, you know, it's being more sensitive to what people are going through, which is good. But I think there is like less of a buzz than you maybe might have expect. Um and I know we spoke about this before, but uh, the number of events we've had in recent years, you know, weddings, you had the funeral. Um, and so there's kind of been the Jubilee last year. There's been a lot of kind of royal events where maybe people's kind of the, you know, the limit of excitement has kind of been used up in some way. Yeah, I think there is a level of royals out, generally speaking. I think we, were, we, had, we got excited for the Jubilee. We got um, brackets excited for the, you know if, if you have this interest in history and seeing what happens we've had some biggies pulled out the queen's funeral that was a lot to see and behold that that will have worn out a lot of the what does that look like for people then uh, you know we now know really clearly what a royal wedding looks like having had several of those we know what a royal funeral looks like having had a few of those we had a pandemic royal funeral mm. we had a non-pandemic royal funeral we've now got a coronation so to, to not to put to put words in in chess's mouth but you know Seeing what it looks like, we've seen a few of these once in a lifetime events. Um, I guess that's where some people are struggling to perhaps yes. get so excited. Royal doubt. Yes, I like that uh, expression. Um, so, I mean, you both hinted at it here. Obviously, there was the news last week about inf- inflation, like, you know, still at 10%, um, highest in Western Europe, double what the inflation rate of the United States, you know, how, how is that then, um, the, co- the inflation, the cost of living crisis impacting the coronation, um, and how, how Brits are feeling about it? I think the royals are really, really sensitive to this, this matter. I think what's quite interesting here is it replicates what we saw 70 years ago. We had the last coronation coming off the back of World War II. That sounds crazy. Is it? So that was in the 50s. But we have to remember we had rationing in the UK well into the 50s. And so the idea that people were, you know, it, it was in, it was a, a tricky, sensitive conversation then. It's a tricky, sensitive conversation 70 years on. I think that's an extraordinary uh, mm. mapping to see that we mm. <laughs> we haven't left challenging times economically and socially. And so I think from that perspective, the royals are quite embedded with this idea of we are not. Um, this is out of sync for a lot of people. What do we do? And you've seen in the last few weeks, you know, the, the positive read I would take on it is huge amount of volunteering, the royal family in society, seeing people, and this desire to create a ceremony that is paired back. You know, the, the, the coronation 70 years ago was hours and hours long with a five-mile procession that went through London about eight times. It gave the marathon a run for its money. <laughs> we've, now, <laughs> we've now got a, a two-hour, you know, an hour and a half ceremony and a, and a mile and a half uh, uh, journey for, for, the, for, the, for the king back to the palace. So I think there is a sense that this all needs to be uh, scaled back. And I think they are very aware of that. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think in the data that we ran as well recently, it was about 40% of people that said the cost of living is actually meaning that they're going to cut back on their celebrations. So I think it's definitely you know playing a big factor in how people are going to celebrate. Um, people are generally just cutting back on going out and and celebrating and, and you know partying and whatever. So I think that will kind of be yeah adding to the mood. It's almost an impossible challenge, right? I guess to throw on a throw a coronation with gold coaches and and crowns and pageantry and sort of quote unquote have it scaled back. Yeah, <laughs> scaled back. There are two gilt carriages. I should point out, and that's coming from a fan. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> I think I do think the other thing is is that we're a bit bank holidayed out. I mean, you know, I can hear our friends around the world listening, thinking, "Oh, poor you." <laughs> but I will say that. You knew you had Easter, people celebrated Easter, and that's expensive. It's expensive entertaining, it's expensive throwing an Easter, having meals for families across a few days. We had another bank holiday, you think, well, okay, I might have some friends over or go out for the day. Another bank holiday. Actually, 
enjoying yourself is typically quite expensive. And so I, I think throwing it in there, it's yes. lovely. Obviously, it's really, really nice to have that time to do something outside of, of the working world. But you, you can only have so many treat days in a small period of time. And I think that would be one of my pushbacks on it being when it is. We're coming off the back of a hard time. Finances are, are taught. And we've got people um, trying to have a nice time, but trying to do it in a measured way. And that is, that's, I mean, that's life, but that's also really, really tricky to, to manage. Yeah. Well, you know, I mentioned in the intro here that, you know, obviously the pageantry and tradition is all very much part of brand Britain. Of course, this is another, another showcase, another event to project that brand uh, at home. And of course, uh, globally. So the coronation is likely to, you know, to give brand Britain a boost. Um, what does brand Britain mean for you personally? I think I have a kind of twofold answer to this. I think when you first say brand Britain, I think I probably have a quite a cliche view. I, may, I imagine what, you know, international people would also have of Britain. So I think of, you know, the traditions, the stability, the strong like heritage and history, our luxury brands. Um, but then there's also the overlap with how I kind of my own personal associations of Britain, which is, and I think this is what brands are moving towards now, but it's not quite for me yet got through, but you know, the celebrating diversity and the multiculturalism and British talent. Um, and also just the everyday things I think that make Britain, you know, the humor I think is a massive one that people can be proud of and, um, the kind of everyday people, um, is, yeah, that's what I take away from it. I love that second point, Jess, because I have sort of a two for also have a twofold view of brand Britain. The set, the first of it, is um, we're very similar, although my, mine always will in this instance take the positive, the very positive spin. But the first part of that being, I think Brand Britain is about quality. You know, we've this amazing heritage of craft and creating things of really high standards in making fabrics and textiles and, and uh, tools and, and objects farming. It's about these standards that are in many ways super, super high and, and really impressive. The other mm. is, is that I think Britain is weird as anything. And I, I love that, you know, it, quirky, I think, could be the nice way of saying it. But I think Brits are bonkers. I think we're <laughs> such a strange bunch. And when you look at it through, if you just take a step back. Well, I, I think if you take back a step and look, I think I love it. Right. You know, when people say that the queuing is weird, the queuing is weird, but it's so good. And, and you know, the fact that you could, it's like a line of ants. You could move Brits anywhere and they would form a line. Nobody else would do that. I think it's so fantastically odd. Um yeah. And that's what the most successful British brands of the last you know, 50, 60 years are the ones to me who have combined those two things. They've taken smart things that we do well and they've realized where it's a bit weird, you know, whether that's Vivian Westwood, who there's never a letdown in quality, these fantastic fabrics and makings and, and designs, the late Dame Vivian Westwood. But it's, it's funny. It's silly. There's a silliness to it that Brits, I think, see in themselves. And I think brand Britain is at its best when it's taking a smirk at itself because there aren't many countries I actually believe who can smirk at themselves quite so much. Yeah, it's interesting that contrast. I was thinking about this question, you know, myself and, uh, you know, of course, after I've been living in the United States for more than 20 years, uh, but obviously grew up in the UK and lived in the UK for many years. But I was thinking about that sort of battle between British Airways and Virgin, which, you know, used to play out. And of course, you've got British Airways as sort of refined and traditional and uh, sort of trustworthy Paddington Bear type of brand. And then you had Virgin, which was more this challenger and more edgy and, you know, more Dr. Martins and you know this sort of battle played out in sort of in transatlantic trans travel but you know on the other hand you know so yeah that contrast right it's that you know they're both aspects of the of brand Britain yes. the edginess and then the trustworthiness and the tradition uh, but the only thing I've, I was also thinking about that that, that was a while ago you know it, it needs a bit of a freshen up it needs to um, we need to see something new from brand Britain I think that's totally fair I think that there is a need to, to innovate within what's happened with Brand Britain. I think that if I were to be twee on my own point, I think it comes back to the fact that there just needs to be an innovation in that in that juncture. You've you've brought you've brought a great mm. example of Virgin versus British Airways, who decided to approach the tack tackle it by polarizing. Let's take fun, let's take sophisticated. I still believe that this the, mm. the newness comes from pairing the two together. Or doing, you know, we, mm. this fantastic um, latest show from Burberry, their new CEO, he held the show in Kennington rather than Hyde Park. It'd been in this glass 
grassy tent in Hyde Park Corner for years and years and years. So smart, so luxurious. He put it in Kennington because his point was everyone in Kennington knows where the best things are to go in for in London. You know, if you need something, they, they, people in Kennington know where to go for stuff. This is where real people are. And, and it, he also had these comical little features, these sort of bustles and little ruching details, sort of using of, of punk fabrics. It's, it's there. It's in the fun. It's in the silly. Well, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, Britain's brand has evolved. You know, but, you know, maybe Jack, you could talk us through how it's evolved over time and uh, where you think it's heading. I think it's evolved over time in, in fits and starts. I think that's the reality of it. And where I'm struggling to your last question is: Are we in a, are we in a fits or a start? Where, where, where are we? I can't quite work it out. I think what happens is is I think the UK is really quick to see where it's behind because I think there are always culturally people here who will point out where we're behind and they're the ones that will leap forward whether it's through how we're dressing whether it's through music whether it's through um the the latest food fashions or fitness fashion you know someone will leap ahead and there will be British pullback there will be a that's not what we are because that's we you know there's a sort of suddenness of of fear it's the Beatles do we want to be about that oh yes we're on board we love a Liverpool pop scene well the Beatles then involve North Indian classical music oh I don't know if we want to be part of that oh no wait it's genius let's jump on board you get this uh, wonderful sort of um, you know slinky effect of people catching up as it goes down the stairs what I can't work out is that at the moment we're asking hard questions about where Britain, brand Britain's got to and about British identity and where it's got to. And are we in a fit or a start? I think we're asking hard questions and the, the catch up is going to be a bit longer because we're asking a lot of questions. It's about diversity. It's about um, the environment. It's about uh, the type of workplace we want to be. It's about work ethics. There are, and this is happening globally a huge number of questions. This isn't just, do you want to get on board with North Indian classical music? (laughs) This is a lot of serious ethical questions for Mm. Brits to get on board with. And so it's going to take a bit of time for the end of the slinky to catch up with the front. But I believe it will. Uh, I think we we will innovate in, in ourselves. You know, we keep coming back to tradition. I mean, a, gra- a country's brand image is rooted in its history. And Britain, of course, has a lot of history. Uh, but it, of course, it's a very much a mixed bag. We have our colonial past, for example. Um, is that history holding brand Britain back? I think, you know, my first response would be yes, but not hugely. I think British history is still, when you kind of look at when you ask people, it's still one of the things that people are proud of in general but I think you know in recent years there's been a bit more of an understanding of the colonial past and particularly among younger generations who are coming to learn of it for the first time kind of beyond what they've learned in school um I'm thinking of like the Gen Zers who I'm in like on the cusp of um you know they've got really strong values of equality and they're kind of surrounded by more diversity they're learning loads more than you know, the older generations were just from their phones on TikTok and the people that they're following. And so I think as they're learning more, this kind of traditional royal uh, kind of, yeah, picture of Britain can be off-putting and doesn't really resonate with their everyday experience. Mm. Um, So I think in that way, it kind of can hold Britain back. But I think it's not to say that brands and institutions aren't trying to to modernise. And I've seen loads of examples in recent years of, brands like British Airways making you know their adverts are far more focusing on diversity and and the everyday kind of British experience but I like I mentioned before I don't think it's quite got through yet to actually where brand Britain is now and how a lot of people actually perceive it um and obviously you know modern Britain isn't isn't just kind of you know tea and the royal family and all these things I think there needs to be kind of those more open displays of diversity and people's the multiculturalism and excitement that people have over that in Britain um, is kind of I think where they can use that to go forward and I think one really good example I just saw well, I recently saw was obviously for the first time this year in Piccadilly um, Circus there was the lights for Ramadan for the first time and I think that's kind of an example of where the you know the future of brand Britain is it's really got to start embracing and, and putting that on the forefront of the brand um, as it seems like it's you know been a very long time coming to start that, to do that. So, yeah, I mean, I think Brand Britain does get held back by its history. Those questions I mentioned are so centred on how we've got to here and where we've come from, and that's quite right. I hear with my positive spin. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because Brits 
are more prepared than some other nations to have that conversation. I think we take flack a bit more readily in some respects to, to, to have it. There's plenty of people who aren't. I'm not speaking for everyone. But I think there are plenty of people that I would chat to across different groups of friends of society that would say, yeah, that wasn't very good. Or, we, you know, what does that mean differently? I love Chess's example. I'll tell you for why. I think some of the reason that brands have been behind and we haven't got off from a branding perspective, from a business corporate perspective, is because it hasn't felt real. We, we, we've gone for glossy over real. There are These aren't anecdotes, diversity in the UK. It's real. It's here. Ramadan, Eid, was a massive event for a huge Muslim population in the UK. Many, many friends of mine, many colleagues of, of Chessis and mine. It's not, it doesn't need an advert <laughs> that, that poaches, this is what, it, this is, you know, we have multicultural Britain. It needs pointing out there are many, many Muslims having a really important moment and celebration and actually showing that, that it's real, there are people in that. That's what the progress needs to be in. This is important for Brits, for real Brit, P- British people who have either been born and raised here or who have chosen here to live, which is a huge honor for us. So I think from that perspective, pointing it back, and that's why I love the Burberry example being in Kennington, pointing it back to the people and the realities of the diversity is more important than putting this glossy, this is our first um, black model in a campaign. You know, who does she, who, what is she part yeah. of? What culture and society is she, she part of? And what does she represent and teach us about that society? Or can we use someone real? Can we engage someone real? Many of us have diverse friends. We learn more from them than we're learning from what the businesses are throwing at us. And I think that realness of connection, as it becomes more real to people, it needs to be more real from businesses. So do you, but do you think it's really possible then to, to, to toe this line where you, you have this tradition and this history and you have this version that you're describing of modern Britain? Do you think the two can actually come together in a single brand identity? Yeah, because you take the tradition, you show that it's there, and then you show where we're at now. It's not the tradition and the history. This is something I take sort of issue with when, when I hear some of the some of my younger friends chatting about it. Sorry, Jess. Is it, if we can get rid of it, we can't. It's there for 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 for, for good or bad, and there's plenty of both. Uh, you know, I'll even accept there's probably more bad than good. I'll take that. And, and but but it's there. We've got this now. How do we fix? the future how do you take it and say all right what's next that might be easy for me to say but i think that's that's what we do Mm. in this in this moment in time we can dwell on the past or we can say what are you going to do where what what, how if you have if you if you haven't learned where are you going next i think businesses are sort of fluffing in the middle of saying well this is Mm. sort of this but we love our telephone boxes and we have paddington bear well who else do we love what else do we do what's next and that's the bit that unless we embrace it no brand britain can't go anywhere yeah, I like I you put, I think you've got you've put your finger on it there with that question, what's next? Because I, I certainly when I think about, you know, Britain's identity, of course, which is tied up with its brand, I mean I've always felt personally that it's clung to its history. Uh certainly sort of in terms of st- struggling to have a vision in that sort of post colonial, post Second World War era, we've still never really crafted a vision of where we want to be in the world and of course that permeates and and cascades down into into brand britain so i think you really put your finger on it there when you say you know what's next all right so let's bring in some perspectives from some of our colleagues some intel colleagues from uh, from around the the globe and i'd love to get your reactions um we i'm going to start with uh ariel from the united states and armory who is french but lives in the uk and we asked um them um to tell us what brand Britain means to them. Hi, my name is Ariel Horton and I am based in the United States. I think Britain has a dependable brand identity of being sophisticated, traditional, and reserved. And while Britain's brand identity has remained consistent throughout the decades, their brand image is always evolving and is heavily influenced, in my opinion, by the prime minister and the royal family. Due to the tensions within the royal family and political figures over the last several years, Britain's brand image is currently more egocentric, inconsistent, hypocritical, stuffy, and outdated. Bonjour, my name is Amory, and as you can tell with my slight accent, I'm French. So I've been living in the UK for the past uh, 12 years now. What comes to mind when I think of Britain as a brand? So I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is respect. Um, respect the value, which is for me one of the most embraced by everyone around here. 
Um, so re respect will be differently from the main one. Um, also, anything related to, I would say, tradition, values, history, um, timeless, and um, tea, tea time, of course. Ouch. Uh, so Ariel um, says egocentric, hypocritical, stuffy, and outdated. Um, so, you know, not holding back. Armory speaks of respect. You know, so obviously two conflicting views there. What do you think? Yeah, that's very interesting, having two pretty different views. I guess the the um, respect comes from that kind of, yeah, the Britishness of kind of, yeah, the polite, the manners, the gentlemanly. Um, but I kind of, you know, with the with Ariel's point, I find it it's interesting, you know, you sometimes can't celebrate, um, separate the kind of politics and things from a brand from a country's brand and the institutions so i think i guess that's where she's uh, getting at now um yeah francesca yeah. do you think that that perception do you think brits know that people outside of the country would have that perception i think so i think so that's i, I, well, I would so <laughs> <laughs> jack any thoughts i think they know it's there to that question i don't know how many of them agree or disagree i think that's a, probably a sliding scale from an age perspective in terms of how offensive and how upsetting they find um, Ariel's comments. I'm not too old. I sit, sit somewhere in the middle. I get Ariel's comments. I understand them entirely. Um, I would say that the world is becoming more aware of hypocrisy. And I think if I go back to my point a few minutes ago, I think that you can chat to Brits many reasonable Brits and they would say, yeah, she's right. There is a hypocrisy here. Um, you should never bat away a, a criticism or a complaint with, have you looked elsewhere? I think everywhere in the world is having that same question. What have we done? How have we got here? And have we made the right decisions all the way along? If someone can turn around and say, yes, we have, good for them. I don't think anyone's clean. I think the UK's long history means we've got a, a bigger library of problems to, to, to pull from. Um, but I think I go back to my point. I think many people are open to these conversations about change, and I don't think that's true everywhere in the world. I think even in our my, my our dear friends in, in Europe, there's a, a a more guarded approach to discussing their history than I see here. Um, and 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 I see you know, from any level, whether you're having your hair cut, whether you're waiting as I did yesterday evening at the physio, you chat to people, and someone will say. But that's not very good. How are they going to cover this? You know, it's expensive. Or they'll say, this, is, this isn't really appropriate. Is this, what are we doing about, you know, I have friends from the original Windrush generation. How do they feel? I think this is showcases that preparedness to talk. But, you know, we've had plenty of movement in our leadership and our, uh, in our political sphere in the last few years. Can we be surprised it hasn't rubbed off, <laughs> rubbed off that well? No. You know, <laughs> yeah. No. Exactly. Well, and these sorry, things these things play out across the globe, right? You know, as I say, I live in the in the US, and of course, you know, a lot of people will ask me about the royal family. They'll usually know more about the royal family than <laughs> than I know my than I know myself, because it plays over here like an ongoing sort of reality sort of TV show. Um, all right. So next up, we've got Joel from Canada uh, and Saptashi from India. My name is Joel Gregoire, and I live in Canada. And when I think of the UK, I first and foremost think of its rainy weather. But beyond that, I think of its culture. For me, that includes James Bond and by extension, Austin Powers, the Premier League and football, my favorite Christmas movie, Love Actually, and one of my favorite series, The Crown, which is how I learned mostly about the royal family, whether it's accurate or not. I also think about some of its food, including Sunday uh, roasts and Yorkshire pudding. Hi, my name is Saptarshi. I'm Senior Lifestyle Analyst from Mumbai. Uh, well, when I think of Britain as a brand, the uh, first thing that comes to my mind is uh, obviously gifting the game of cricket to us and for which, which kind of enabled us to witness greats such as Sachin and Kohli. Well, other than that, I, I, I think uh, we also connect with the rich English heritage which is also seen across a kind of convey through the structures and buildings that we have throughout our nation. So yeah, that, those would be the two. Uh, so Joel, uh, Joel actually made me feel uh, quite homesick there talking about Yorkshire pudding. Um, he also referenced the the global powerhouse that is the the Premier League. Saptash, you talked about cricket and the tradition that you know you, you can still see visibly uh, throughout India in some of the old sort of colonial 
architecture. Um, what do you think? I loved uh, Joel's response. I think that's all the yeah really nice things. I mean, he's definitely not wrong about the rain at the moment, but <laughs> yeah, the the football, <laughs> the football, the music, the films, um, the food. I think that's all the really stuff that's easy to to absorb and celebrate in Britain. So I would yeah, I would back that response a lot. He did touch on one thing that he talked about the English Premier League, of course, which is not really brand Britain, which kind of touches a a point there about the obviously sub brands within uh, the United Kingdom. That's true. He did touch on sub brands. It's a tr- that's a tricky conversation for us again. If you prepared for more of those, um, <laughs> that, that is one that I think. If we were to, we're lucky from a global brand Britain perspective, I think we're lucky that people either aren't aware of it globally or they, they, they don't have the time to differentiate because that's a, another whole level of challenge when it comes to the same topics, you know, the same cha- challenge topics. But I was very happy to hear some friendliness from Canada. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, I, 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 I think those are all lovely things. I will say it. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Joel talked about real people things. They're parts of people's lives. Yeah. They're not what we market the UK on. That's something he's experienced his, as part of his heritage. Mm. When we said heritage, Chess and I have gone to, to style and, and national uh, and some of the bigger ticket things. He's referenced people heritage issues, you know, things that are very mm-hmm. real. And so it comes back to my obsessive point today. It's British people that should be part of the new brand Britain. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's literally though, it's whatever resonates. I mean, you think about sometimes you're talking about cricket. I mean, in India, you know, the people are arguably, I mean, not arguably, I think they're more, more passionate about cricket than they are um, in the United Kingdom. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so fine, let's, t- let's uh, listen to uh, Victoria from China and Jan from Germany. Hi, this is Victoria. I'm based in China. When I think of Britain as a brand, I think it evokes a sense of elegance and refinement with its rich history and traditions. Hi there, my name is Jan Urbanek. I work for Mintel in Germany and I'm based in Dusseldorf. And when I think of Britain as a brand and what I associate with products that have a British origin, I think I typically link it to a certain level of poshness. And I think this is also reflected in how typically British products are branded and marketed on the German market. For example, if we take a look at British cookies or British tea, they are typically branded in a rather posh and premium way. And while this sounds very stereotypical, this isn't a bad thing at all. For example, if we take a look at Mini Cooper, which is owned by the German car manufacturer BMW, they deliberately choose to stick to the Mini Cooper's British heritage and British branding, for example, by integrating the Union Jack and the taillights of the car. And I think this works quite well with the premium positioning of the car and also underscores that even outside of the UK, companies are quite aware of how powerful a British branding, a British country of origin can be for products. Victoria speaks to elegance. Jan mentions what he calls poshness. What do you think? I think this is a super, super interesting one. Uh, poshness is not always our. Is not always is a, is a is a temperamental word for English people. It's it's, it's not a wrongly used word in this instance, and and it contrasts nicely with elegance. I think that there is. Let's give our BA shout out from before, albeit uh, uh, to the start of the conversation. I think there is an understatedness to British elegance that is quite special and quite unique. I think if you look at how our luxury hotels in London or around the UK pitch pitch their smartness, if you will, it's often through this slightly quiet sense of luxury that I think is super important. Is it about the materials and fashion? Is it about the comfort of your bed in the hotel? It's often not having the world's largest chandelier that we might see as a, as a way of p- promoting luxury elsewhere. It's often not about... Um, having the most perfect atrium or the most perfectly impressive views. It's often about quiet uh, and thought out comfort, which is something that probably wasn't true 100 years ago. And I think this is a really important part of actually how brand Britain goes forward, because we're in a world where luxury is a super competitive sphere, where high end is becoming higher and higher and higher end and more competitive. And brands are moving away 
from national luxuriness. They're, they're losing some of their identity as they compete on a global scale to communicate luxury. And some of the older mm. places are clinging on to their national identity and their, their traditions as a way of communicating luxury. I think this is the way to longevity. That's not to say we need to stick. I've not gone back on myself. We need to keep sticking to putting a telephone box on your handbag to say this is how we sell luxury. <laughs> what I'm saying is British has a tradition in craft. Britain has a tradition in, 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 in textiles, in fabric. It has a tradition in a certain way of style and service. These are really important parts of this. Are we over the top in terms of our service and give people a really, really flaunting and ex wonderful experience where you feel like you are the, the queen yourself? No. You, I'm afraid we we'll probably need to go over the pond to the US to get that level of, of real um, friendly uh, service that's there. But there's a quietness that tries to focus on reading what you need and, and responding to that, particularly in our mm -hmm. higher end services, uh, you know, centers. And I think that's the way forward because... It will keep brand Britain. It won't just make me, mean global luxury brand. It will mean global British luxury brand. I think that's really, really important. Poshness, however, is a problem for us because poshness is an internal. <laughs> it is an internal challenge, and it means that all those things are inaccessible. And actually, to Chess's yeah. point earlier, we need to be more accessible. Yeah, I think that's a great response, Jack. Yeah, the only the, I was going to pick up on the poshness. I think. Well, the other comments, yeah, I made about you know, the British brand hold, it comes with, a, like we've mentioned before, a lot of quality and high standards and that works well for brands. Um, and then the poshness, I think, yeah, it's something people wouldn't necessarily like to be called, but I think it's, yeah, it speaks to the kind of that, that view of very kind of old style kind of elite, uh, in Britain, but that's just not the everyday. And like we've mentioned many times, I think that's the key to it. It's the, being more accessible and actually relaying the everyday experience of British people, um, which there's huge potential to do. But I think that's interesting. That's the word that, that came out because I think that's, yeah, well, well, like we've mentioned, that's where the challenge is lying. It's moving forward. We need to open it up and be a lot more accessible. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's certainly interesting that you have this variety of different perspectives from from across the globe. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting as well that, you know, to what extent does a brand – um, a country's brand can it be sort of levered into into sort of power into soft power around the world I mean to what ex you know to what extent do you think things like the royal family the English language you know to what extent does that help Britain to exert soft power around the world so the the benefit of the English language can't be understated it's a principal privilege of, of being part of the UK mm. and it's one that we extort all too often I can't say sorry for everyone, but it's one that we, we rely on and we, we get a huge amount of benefit from. We have a principal language that means we can communicate really broadly. Um, that's, that is what it is. It, it's a huge benefit that we hold here. We are readily understood widely. Well, I mean, our languages, I don't know how well understood we are, <laughs> albeit those, those, quotes, <laughs> those quotes suggest perhaps we're better understood than, than I, than I would have realized. Um, but what, what, what comes with, with that is that back and forth you go the traditional side of being british we can see as a positive or a negative and go back to my slinky mm. example we're old and actually things come and go politically around the world things come and go <laughs> democracy comes and goes these these things come and go and move having been around a long time means that we can be a real beacon of understanding that change and you know i said to someone the other day um you know, we haven't really made much change, perhaps. And they said, well, we're not feudal still. You know, we're not still all worshipping up to a certain, to up to the king. Change is slow. And what what the monarchy have allowed us to do is to, to, to rate against the speed of change that we see. It allows us to co create a stick against which we want to measure ourselves. And that's, you know, that's in the size of the UK. That's also globally. When the Queen died last year, people were aware globally that was a big deal. 70 years she'd been in power. Australians, Canadians, Americans, Indians, people around the world have seen across the 70 years a huge amount of change in their own countries at a global level. And what it allows them to do is to use that beacon of time and assess the world. That makes the UK... Uh, it elevates our importance more than it should do. But it, it, it just gives us, it makes us part of how people think about time and span. It's a huge privilege that we have to take, uh, not, not credit for, we have to take, not advantage of, but we have to be respectful of ourselves and we have to also understand why 
we're criticized so harshly, why we're seen in such a difficult mm. way. Because we have the privilege of being around for so long, the privilege of being involved in history around the world, um, somewhat to, to the detriment sometimes of other people and often of other people. Now time, those questions come back at us. They're hard. They're difficult questions. And they are reflective of a country that's been somewhere and everywhere for a long, long time. So actually, the questions that come at us aren't flattering always, but they are questions that are worth thinking about. And they're questions that if we want to be important, we have to be able to answer. They're, 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 they are, in many respects, a luxury to be able to ask, answer those questions. Mm. Well, it, well let's, let's think then about you know, then the impact then on, on corporations, on business, you know, how important is brand Britain to British companies and British industry in general? Um, so, yeah, I'd say it's hugely important. There's a really strong brand behind brand Britain, which we can see between people's answers and our own answers of how we, of we think of it. And I think it is very helpful if brands want to latch onto that. It can, it, there's perceptions of it kind of being, you know, trustworthy, high quality. We've talked about craftsmanship Um and kind of a sensible, like, sen- yeah, a sensible, yeah, reassuring choice. Um, and that definitely works well, I think, for, you know, premium and luxury brands like we've spoken about. Um, and it can work across loads of different is- industries too. So the first one I think that comes to mind is obviously the British fashion. Um, and it's worked really well there with, you know, craftsmanship and we've got a n- number of designers. And then you've got iconic brands like Barbara and Burberry, which I think everyone kind of can think of when they think of British fashion brands that have really strongly held on to their heritage um, and kind of based their, you know, the branding around being British. So I think it's works really well there. And the other one that springs to mind is, um, is gin. I know it's, I don't think it necessarily started in in Britain, but there's a number of, you know, really nice gin brands that I think really hone down on their provenance and their their Britishness. So you've got kind of Hendrix and Sip Smith of London and, and pieces like that, which for me, you know, kind of, yeah, evokes a feeling of kind of British spring, summertime and their quality brands. And I think that's what, you know, brand Britain can do for some people. It can evoke a feeling and a sense and some emotions that, you know, people want to kind of then engage with the products. Um, so yeah, I think a range. Yeah, I don't think we have to. I don't think brands have to get rid of all of that either. I think they just need to think harder about the story. I think we've had this surge of startups running up to the pandemic. You know, startup businesses across the UK, many of them starting since the last financial downturn, the, the global banking crisis, as people left their jobs, as people were left without jobs started to look into what they wanted and how they wanted. Lots of these brands are approaching some of the questions we've talked about in this in a really interesting way, whether that's sustainability, whether that's diversity, whether it's about how they support the communities they work in. Some of them are doing it in a really, really innovative way. And I loved Chess's gin example because you get small batch food manufacturers who are telling stories about different parts of the UK. They are telling stories about being Cornish or Plymouth, or they're telling stories about being from Derbyshire or cheese from regions we don't know it's from. I'm from Herefordshire. I assume that all cheese and beef should be from Herefordshire. I'm learning that's not true. I, I, slowly but surely, hopefully my father won't listen to this podcast. But um, I, I think that, that what's happening is, is that we need bigger brands to realize, to, to learn from these smaller brands. And we, we saw a bit of that coming up to the pandemic where we saw more um, acquiring of smaller new businesses, where we saw um, startup schemes and, and, and internal learnings. We need to revert to that as the world starts to get back to normal because there's so much to learn from people near to the real Britain about what's possible going forwards. Is it the types of charities you work with? Big brands love to work with charities. They go with all the big ones. I don't know any better than to suggest that. But what is better? Is there a small charity that would be transformed by what you're doing that is really answering some of these questions? Is there a scheme? You know, I know you know some of the work that shout out to Mintel that Mintel's done, whether it's about offering new opportunities for internships to those who may not otherwise have had them. These are the way of communicating that you're part of Brand Britain. And we we kind of know they work in the UK. They're a way of, of getting us some clout. I think they're a way of getting us a better global reputation as well. Taking these lessons and not just feeling we have to be safe. We play it safe. We panic. We put a telephone box on it or at worst, you know, a a soldier outside Buckingham Palace. We don't need 
to do it. We, you, you've got the idea. You think that Brits get it. Everyone else will get it as well. There is no one in the world that doesn't stand, this is a disadvantaged person. We're going to try harder to look after them. That's a story that resonates everywhere, I'm afraid to say. I'm sorry to say. Um, tell that story. It's, it's surprisingly new. That's what you want to do. It's shamefully new. And I think that if we were braver with Brand Britain and braver with what we want to show we can do and stop being so reliant on oh and by the way here's a corgi um i think people would love it i think people would really <laughs> jump in so so see so, uh, what other ways then can can business leverage uh, a country's brand to create opportunities so yeah i think the good thing about brand britain which we've discussed is it's very well established and we've established as kind of you know more it's not just one type of brand britain there's the tradition and then there's the the modern view that we all see it going and what we'd like to celebrate more so i think for brands it's kind of asking which type of britain are you appealing to you don't have to forget all the, the traditions and some of those cliches can work especially with if you're attracting one attracts people to come over here you know some of those cliches can still work but i think if you're it's yeah asking yourself who are you trying to you know speak to and if you are looking for a more trying to open it up then you need to yeah add in some of those modern elements that we've discussed um and go beyond the kind of traditions and celebrate the things that we all love, the everydayness. And yeah, I always think the British talent and like I mentioned before, the humour, I think things like that that could be definitely celebrated more and would really, people would love. So We have to be less worried about being seen slightly embarrassedly. We know we're a bit weird. We know we're a bit, we've got dottiness in the country. We know that things don't always make sense in terms of how it runs, how it looks. We're not very good running to time, despite our love of queuing. Um, we have to be less afraid of that. So I, I love Chess's point and, and happy to take the formality and then do what we do best and take the fun out of it and show that it's it's silly. Because if you swing all the way back round, you know, it's all about the loops in the conversation. Swing all the way back round, that will get rid of some of our concerns about being stuffy and, and posh. You think about what Ariel said about stuffy. I don't think I have any stuffy friends, and I'm quite stuffy. Um, you know, <laughs> take the stuffiness out of these things. You can, Brits can do that. We, we, have, we do it all the time to ourselves. Yeah. So communicating that will make us so much more accessible. Um, and as, as, as Chess said, the ingredients are all there. Add them together, and, and, and people will think, that's not quite how I saw the UK, and that's what you want. You want to be a different story that says it's still a quality product. It's still gorgeous. It's still... It's still, it's still all of those things we want it to be, but it's also fun and it's for you. Whether it's a handbag or a shoe or a cheese, it's fun and it's for you. And that's, we need it. <laughs> well, I'm definitely going to be uh, watching the coronation with a different perspective after this uh, discussion today. Well, this is brilliant, a brilliant conversation. I guess, you know, three um, takeaways uh, from my perspective perspective or the three things that really stood out for me of course number one i think that obviously a, a country's brand is is critically important it's continuously evolving and i love what you were saying jack about you know businesses brands corporations brands need to be brave and embrace this you know the a country's the nation's brand in their stories uh and you know and francesca when you talked about you know you need to understand you know what aspects or what type of britain's um, brand are you actually appealing to to really sort of understand and, and leverage it to for your own um, you know for the benefit of consumers um, I think number two of course this, this correlation really marks a pivotal moment in terms of brand Britain um, and the trajectory of Britain's brand you know once again it's a great state I mean there's been many of these events but it's a great staging ground to promote Britain's brand around the world and I think the question that really stood out for me though was Jack when you said what's next um, and Francesca when you sort of reinforce that point it's all about what's next for brand britain um there's so much variety um so much nuance but there's so much potential all right so with that thank you jack and francesca thank you everyone for listening the conversation doesn't end here head over to mintel's linkedin and instagram and let us know what you think we'd love to hear your thoughts about brand britain or any other of the other topics that we cover on the podcast if you want to know more about mintel visit mintel.com and sign up to become a member of the free mintel spotlight community make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on apple podcasts spotify or wherever you get your podcasts goodbye for now and we'll catch you next time for a new episode of Little Conversation.